have another IEP alum, Sylvia Bohr, who graduated. Sylvia, I think it was 2016 or 15. Which was it? Um, it was 2012, actually. Really? Yeah. Holy <laughs> Wow, okay, I'm really dating myself. Eight years. <laughs> All right, sorry about that, everybody. I need oh to get my. my facts straight <laughs> next time. But uh, I just I just saw you, you know, relatively recently at that gathering. So maybe that's what just made me uh, miss, you know, misremember. But anyway, um, Sylvia has been at Wild Aid for the last few, uh, few years, based up in San Francisco and working in the Marine Conservation uh, Division there. And she's here to talk about a topic that's really dear to my heart, which is behavior change. I think, you know, environmentalists in the last decade are really starting to take this seriously. And it's still a really largely untapped field with huge potential. So really uh, excited to hear her presentation. Uh, as Rachel has mentioned, you can put questions into the chat function and uh, we will then, uh, you know, assess them at the end and make sure we get to as many as we can. Uh, so uh, with that, Sylvia, thanks so much for, for joining us and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to start off by asking everybody, have you thought about what is most important to you? So up until last year, protecting the environment was a huge part of my life. I was committed to incorporating sustainable habits into every single facet of my lifestyle. I took public transportation to work. I um, used reusable products. I avoided single-use plastics. Um, I ate mostly vegetarian. Sorry, Jason, I'm not quite vegan yet. <laughs> and um, honestly, right, it, was right. just, <laughs> it was just really hard for me to empathize with, with people, especially the people with the means to do so, who didn't care about the environment. And then my life totally changed. Um, my husband and I had a baby last year. Now, I know what you're thinking, you know, it's totally possible to be eco-friendly and incorporate that into parenthood, right? Well, I, that was my intention, but then my son was born three and a half months early. He was born by emergency C-section. Um, so this is him, this is Felix. He was about two weeks old here. Um, when he was born, he weighed just one pound, six ounces. He was tiny, tiny, tiny. And he was very delicate. He um, needed to be intubated for several weeks. Um, and his lungs just were not in great shape. He was very delicate. He was in the neonatal intensive care unit for five whole months. Um, that means that we couldn't take him home. He was in the hospital um, and he was fighting for his life every day for a very long time. It was really tough. Um, you know, my husband and I, we trekked back and forth every single day to go see our son and just to be there for him. And so, you know, needless to say, I just, I couldn't prioritize the environment with everything else I was dealing with. So, you know, my dreams of reusable diapers and organic products and, you know, what have you, all of that went out the window. Um, there was no way that I could care about paper towel usage or gas consumption or, you know, eating vegetarian meals. Um, I mean, honestly, like we were just so focused on survival and we were just trying to take things one day at a time. Um, I ate so much hospital food. <laughs> uh, we depended on the kindness of our family. Uh, Felix was very, very delicate. He, you know, a cold would, could possibly kill him. So it was just, it was a really, really tough time. Um, so, you know, even though the environment was the absolute last thing on my mind at the time, this experience was actually what ended up driving us to get an electric car and to install solar panels at our house. Now, these were things that we had put off for a while because they were expensive, they were investments. And so, you know, it was, it was in our minds, but it was something for the future. And when Felix was born, we like, all we could think about was just, you know, how do we make our lives easier? How can we make this journey uh, that much simpler for us? And the electric car was honestly one of the best purchases that we made. Um, before that, we were driving about 30 minutes each way, you know, to the hospital and back. And we had to stop at the gas station, like, way more than, than before. And it was just a big inconvenience. It was time that we could have been spending with our son. It was time that we could have been sleeping because we weren't, <laughs> we weren't getting almost any rest. And the electric car, like, helped so much because we could just plug it in at night and then just forget it and go. Um, 
And then likewise with the solar panels, I was pumping milk. My son couldn't eat uh, for a long time. He was fed by IV. And so I generated a collection of, of breast milk in a chest freezer in our garage. And at the time, you know, we were doing power shutoffs because of wildfire season, <laughs> kind of like this year, right? And, um, and we were just so concerned. We were like, what happens if they shut off our power? Um, all that breast milk will be wasted, right? And so we got solar panels because we knew that that could be a concern. And then also that our son would most likely come home on oxygen. So, you know, accidentally, we kind of made these changes that were enormously good for the environment en route to making our lives much, much easier. So, you know, my experience is pretty unique. I, I don't wish this on anybody. I don't know many people that have gone through something like this, but everybody in the world is dealing with their own versions of this story. You know, everybody has something that might hold them back from making a change towards sustainability. So today I wanna to talk to you guys about how we as environmentalists can help to change behaviors towards sustainability without asking people to sacrifice the things that are most important to them. As Jason mentioned, my name is Sylvia Bohr. I've been working as Wild Aids Marine Program Officer for the last four years. Um, we primarily work at strengthening enforcement at marine protected areas, MPAs, and preventing illegal fishing and poaching. So Wild Aid is a nonprofit. Um, we're based here in San Francisco, but we work globally. We work all over the world in places like China, Vietnam, Palau, Ecuador, Indonesia, um, to end the illegal wildlife trade. And Wild Aid has played a key role in reducing the demand for ivory and shark fins, as well as ensuring that marine species can be better protected in their habitat. So this is a picture of me in coastal Ecuador. Uh, to the left of me is a ranger from Pacocha National Park, and to the right is Chinese celebrity Eddie Peng. So this is a pretty cool story. We were filming a documentary about sea turtles and why they're so important to protect. Um, we also wanted to educate people on the impacts of their actions. So for instance, things like plastic consumption, how they affect the environment directly. So Eddie over there is holding a sea turtle egg and uh, the Pacocha Rangers will then mark the nest to protect it from predators and accidental encroachment. So I love my job. It is, I really feel that we're making a big difference in different areas. And honestly, one of the best parts of it has just been meeting some truly fascinating people. So many of the people that I've met have been living in extreme poverty. Um, the places that Wild Aid works, like Pacoche, they're coastal communities. And the people there are just struggling to survive. Um, honestly, you know, fishing is one of the most reliable livelihoods that they have access to. Many of them, literally every day, they don't know how they're going to feed their families. Um, some of these people live in shacks. They have, you know, tin roofs, tarp sometimes. Um, some places have no running water. You know, forget about internet. Like, that's just unheard of. Um, people walk everywhere. Um, in some of the communities that I've seen, you just see people running around barefoot. Um, they, they can't really afford shoes or, or clothing. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really sad. Um, but, you know, most people are, they're happy with, with their lifestyle. And, um, you know, and they're just trying to make do. Um, so when we as environmentalists come in, a lot of our solutions for conservation and for sustainability involve, you know, reducing their catch or uh, perhaps asking them not to fish a certain species or um, you know to spend money on new fishing gear that's more sustainable for us it might seem like a really small thing but for them it is an enormous sacrifice um, you know the money that they would spend on that fishing gear is equivalent to several weeks worth of meals for instance so when we're talking about you know future worries about conservation or perhaps um, increasing marine species in a particular place, those arguments are not compelling to them. They're not going to change their behaviors. They're not going to change their way of life when for them survival is the most pressing problem. So that brings me to my three E's. Um, we have to figure out what is compelling to these communities. We have to figure out what they really need if we really want them to change their behaviors. Um, you know, if we, if we want to enact these solutions, we need to meet people on their level. So with that, um, I'd like to present the three E's. The first one is empathize. You have to find common ground with your audience. Next is engage. You need to show them what's in it for them, 
How can they benefit from your solutions? And lastly, enforce. You have to ensure that other people cannot benefit from their sacrifice. And so together, these three actions can help you inspire people to change their behaviors towards conservation. Let me tell you a little bit more. Okay, so first and foremost, we need to get these communities to listen to our message. You need to understand what is important to your audience. Um, they're not going to listen to you if they don't think that, you, that you've automatically assumed that you know things about them. A lot of times they just wanna be heard. Sometimes they even have really good ideas for, for how to make a change in their community and they just want somebody to hear it. So first listen, and then you can customize your suggestions to them. And your attitude is really important. You know, you can't come in thinking that, that you have all the answers or that you know everything about them because oftentimes we've, and we've seen this directly, we've been proven wrong many, many times. And really our message will get lost if we can't find a way to relate to them, to gain their trust. So you might wonder, how can we relate if we're not part of their group or their community? This picture is um, a wild aid training that we did in Barbuda, which is an island in the Caribbean. Now, most of our project managers and trainers from the US are white and male. <laughs> it's not really representative of the communities where we work. We work in Palau and throughout Latin America, Southeast Asia. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of women in these communities. Um, and honestly, we just, we don't, look anything like them. We don't sound anything like them. Um, these, these wild eaters are phenomenally uh, knowledgeable on the topic of, of marine enforcement and marine protection. But if we can't find a way to relate, they're not going to listen to our message. So wild aid has been able to, um, to gain their trust and to relate to our audience in several ways. So first, we try to connect with the community and learn more about their needs. This is Pacocha MPA. You guys already saw a little picture of it um, with me in the field. Um, we started working here in 2015 and one of its most prevalent features is this gorgeous sea turtle nesting beach. Um, you can see over there, there's, um, there's some little corralled off areas. Those are sea turtle nests. And so the rangers patrol that stretch of beach every day, they find sea turtle nests and they mark them. Now, in 2018, we wanted to find out what the surrounding communities thought about the work that was being done there. And so we sent Wild Aid Marine fellow, uh, Raina Hines, to, to live in Ecuador for three months. And her whole job was just to listen to them, to find out about their needs. Um, now, this is a picture of her um, interviewing some of the community members. We were there to listen, not to advise or judge. And even with that, we had a really hard time gaining the community's trust. Um, they knew that we were working with the Ministry of Environment. They knew that we were working with the Rangers. And so they, some of them were worried that, you know, that, that they would get in trouble if they confessed to something that could potentially be illegal, right? Um, and so we had to find a way to, to get them to trust us. And so, the MPA managers and rangers, new people in the communities. And so they introduced us and then we were introduced to community leaders. And from there, we were able to kind of uh, start getting people that, that would answer our questions. And once we did gain their trust, it was incredible. We found out so many things that we just had no idea about, even in the, the few years that we had been working there. So first we found out that some of these communities were already working in conservation. This is a picture of a marine corral. They have, they're basically like uh, man-made tide pools to sustainably catch fish and other seafood. Um, these, these marine corrals have been in existence for generations in some of these communities. And, um, and the people there already support them and, and, and they already you know, make sure to, um, to protect them. And so really they just wanted our help to, to keep them safe from outsiders. Um, there were people that wanted more access to education and other career opportunities. Um, some people wanted help getting their products to new markets. And honestly, the most surprising thing for us of all was that there was just a desire for more protection, more ranger patrols um, to protect from outside trawlers and, um, you know, more information. 
And so we wouldn't have found this out if we didn't stop to listen to the community. So next, we partner with local organizations. So the organizations. Oh, sorry. I think somebody, somebody just talked on. <laughs> um, anyway. So uh, the organizations that we partner with have local community ties, they know the people, the government, and they can act as intermediaries. Um, so these organizations, we, we empower them, we teach them about our methodology, about our, um, our solutions, and then they go out and they engage the community. So for instance, in Palau, we work with a couple different organizations. We work with Palau Conservation Society and the Nature Conservancy on different projects. Um, now, Palau Conservation Society is local. Um, it's, it's, it was founded in Palau, and so they hire local Palauans. They're very, very well enmeshed within the community. The Nature Conservancy is a US-based organization, but their Palau office is staffed by local people. And so there is virtually no difference between the two organizations and the way that they interact with the community. And when I was there, I was able to really see how the Nature Conservancy staff interacted. And you could tell that they belonged to the community. Um, and the community members really trusted us and they opened up their, their homes sometimes because we partnered with the Nature Conservancy. So having these partnerships has opened up doors for us and it's really gotten people to listen to our solutions in places where maybe we wouldn't have had that opportunity. The last thing that we do is we train former fishers as rangers. So these fishermen know and they can relate to the fishing community. In Indonesia, for example, we hired former shark finners um, to, to work as rangers. Now I know that's a little bit counterintuitive. You might think that, <laughs> that there might be a conflict of interest there, but actually they have been some of our best champions for, um, for our efforts. They know the shark finning community. They know what solutions, what arguments will work best um, in getting them to change their behaviors. And for the people that don't want to change their behaviors, they know where to catch them. <laughs> they know uh, the best fishing grounds. They know strategies. It's, it is fantastic. Um, when I was in Ecuador, I met a ranger who was a former fisher, and he was such a passionate supporter of conservation. Um, you could just tell that, you know, that once you've convinced a fisher about the benefits of conservation, you will just have a wonderful ally for life. So these three methods have all helped WildAid to better relate to the communities we work in and find out what is important to them so that we can then figure out what type of solution will work best for them. Okay, so now that you've got your audience's attention, you need to show them what's in it for them. Um, you need to be prepared with data-driven responses to questions. Um, many of these community members will have very specific questions like, you know, how much will my catch increase? Um, what will this cost? How long will this take? And when you're presenting your solution, you need to have these answers ready. If you don't know them, you know, find out, don't, don't just make stuff up. Um, you, but just be prepared, try to anticipate what they're going to ask. And ultimately, when you do respond to their questions, you really need to think about the benefits to them first and the environment second. Um, I know that's counterintuitive to how many environmentalists think. You know, we usually think about things like uh, biodiversity and fish mass. We work with scientists. Um, we speak in technical terms. But really, we have to keep our language simple when we're dealing with these communities. Because the important thing is that they can understand your message and how it will change their lifestyle rather than using the specific scientific language. I mean, things like biodiversity and fish biomass, they are fantastic terms. They're very specific, but they mean nothing to your audience. So instead, talk to them about how they will benefit. You know, for instance, if the fish populations will increase, tell them what that means for them. It means that they're going to expend less effort catching the same amount of fish that they would have caught before. That means that they'll use less fuel, which means they'll spend less money. They'll be able to catch more fish in the same amount of time, or perhaps spend less time on the ocean, which they can then spend with their families. Whatever is most compelling to them, that's what you need to talk about, not about the, you know, the environmental facts that while they're super cool and very compelling to us, are not that convincing to them. So you might wonder what this looks like in practice. Um, we use this approach in the small village of Lamakara, Indonesia. 
And now this village was one of the top manta hunting sites in the world. At one point, they were killing over a thousand mantas every year for their gill rakers. Um, the gill rakers are this, this organ that mantas have to filter water. In traditional Chinese medicine, this supposedly boosted the immune system and it could do everything up to curing cancer, right? This is not true, but people believed it. And so there was a huge demand. Um, people paid a lot of money for manta gill rakers. And unfortunately, they were just getting decimated all over the world. So in 2014, Indonesia declared a manta sanctuary. They made it illegal to hunt mantas. But of course, many fishermen only saw the impact on their livelihoods. They were getting a lot of money from the mantas. And so for them, the benefits of manta conservation, that they weren't seeing that. And so they continued to hunt mantas illegally. So that's where Wildlife came in. We partnered with the Mizul Foundation in Indonesia. And our plan was to transition fishermen to alternative livelihoods and more sustainable and legal fishing sources. So we hosted events um, in this picture. Uh, there's, we, were, we did an outreach event. We did a screening of this movie called Racing Extinction. And basically it was for the community to learn about the benefits of mantas and their plight, what was going on, why we cared about their survival. And aside from events like this, we recruited six local university students as interns, and it was their job to, to recruit fishermen and to, and to basically tell them about our plan to help them make up their profits that they would lose from manta hunting via these alternative livelihoods. Once we were able to convince fishers to join our, our efforts, we asked them to sign a pledge that they would no longer hunt mantas. It was kind of, it was a formal commitment and this was actually sent to the government of Indonesia. So it was, it was very serious. Now the results were just phenomenal. Um, we were able to train 258 community members in alternative livelihoods. This included manta research. So many of the fishermen knew where mantas uh, congregated. And so instead of using that information to hunt them, we were able to use that information um, to take pictures and to identify them and figure out more about their mating, eating, general behavior. Um, we also trained fishermen in the use of fish aggregation devices. These are um, basically large bait balls in the middle of the ocean that make it easier to lure and catch big pelagic fish species. These are open ocean fish. Um, and then we also trained local women to make shredded fish balls, which were used as bait and were sold at local seafood markets. We also trained 324 community members as rangers um, to enforce the new regulations. And the most important part was that there was a huge decrease in the number of mantas killed. So in just the two years that we were working there in 2017, only six mantas were caught that entire year and killed for their gill rapers. In fact, the results were so dramatic that some of the fishermen actually rescued mantas that were entangled in fishing gear. Now, previously, they would have let those mantas die and sold them for the profits, but they saved them instead. I mean, honestly, these results were just simply amazing, but we really could not have achieved this much compliance without complementary enforcement. Which brings me to the final E. So after convincing the community about the benefits of your solution, there will still be outliers. Now, you will never get 100% compliance in, any, in anything. Um, so there will always be outliers and they will try to reap the benefits of the MPA without making those sacrifices. So for instance, in La Macera, even though most of the community was convinced, some people still wanted to hunt mantas. They still saw it as, as a higher benefit than a cost. And now that only six mantas were targeted, they of course had a much bigger pool that they could tap into. They had much less competition. And so really regular ranger patrols and investigations to find them and penalize them were the only way that we were able to make sure that they couldn't continue hunting mantas. Now this helped to convince some of those outliers to join our cause, but it also encouraged people that had already committed to it. It showed them that we were serious about, about making sure that their sacrifice was protected. So, you know, we often think of enforcement as something that is opposed to community. Um, in the current climate, enforcement is kind of a dirty word, right? But effective enforcement really ensures equality and fairness. And MPAs with effective enforcement have almost three times greater conservation benefits. You might wonder why that is. It's because it means that people cannot get away with cheating the system. It also means that outsiders can't benefit from the hard work of the community. Unfortunately, places with great marine diversity 
And make no mistake, the MPAs that, that are working do have great marine diversity. They attract outsiders and these people will deplete their resources. They have no incentive not to do it because they can always move on to the next spot. They're not part of the local community. So when we ask communities to adhere to sustainable fishing regulations, we need to promise them that we will protect their marine resources from outliers and from these outsiders as well. And that's exactly what the Galapagos National Park has done incredibly well. For those of you that haven't been to the Galapagos, it's about 500 miles from coastal Ecuador. It's roughly a one and a half hour plane ride from coastal Ecuador, um, followed by a ferry ride from Baltra Island to Santa Cruz Island. Then you take about an hour cab ride <laughs> to the town of Puerto Ayora. And finally, depending on what island you want to go to, um, you'll catch a boat, a ferry boat, um, which is essentially a, a speed boat. It's a harrowing roller coaster of a journey <laughs> for about two hours to get to whatever island you'd like to go to. It is 100% worth it. Um, the islands are gorgeous. Um, but, you know, its protection is very complex. There is no commercial fishing allowed within the boundaries of the reserve. And in fact, they, um, they have various zones. So some places artisanal fishers can fish. Other places are 100% no take. Um, and they have numerous threats from both foreign and domestic fisheries. So 20 years ago, when Wild Aid first started working there, they had a group of passionate, dedicated rangers with no training. These guys are, were basically biologists. They had zero enforcement experience, and they had one broken down patrol vessel to patrol an area the size of New York State. Just to give you an idea, it's about five days boat ride to get from one end of the reserve to the other one. It's huge. So because of this limited enforcement, at one point they had over 12,000 sharks being poached from their waters annually due to the demand for shark fins. Today, there's virtually no shark finning within the boundaries of the reserve. This is because they have a robust and comprehensive enforcement system. They have strong protection. They work together with the community and they use data-driven reasoning behind all of their fisheries regulations. They make sure that they're very transparent with the community about these as well, so that they understand why they're doing the things that they're doing. So the results have been absolutely astounding. The Galapagos has incredibly strong surveillance. They have 73 rangers specifically dedicated to marine enforcement. These guys are all trained and certified. They now have eight patrol vessels and a patrol plane. In fact, one of the most important things that we did was we helped to foster a partnership between the Galapagos National Park and the Ecuadorian Navy. This partnership means that there is a naval officer present on every single one of the Galapagos National Park patrols. It also means that, rain, that the rangers have access to naval equipment, all of the vessels, all, all of the ships that they have. It means that they have access to naval intelligence. Um, it's just been a phenomenal partnership. And um, because of this, this increased support, in 2019, they conducted over 11,000 patrols, uh, patrol hours, sorry, um, and they had over 1,600 inspections. They have an electronic vessel monitoring system that we help them procure that allows them to see 100% of the reserve remotely. They have one control center in Puerto Ayora, which um, allows them to see every single vessel um, transiting within the reserve. It is a phenomenal system and they're able to do smarter patrols. Because of this, um, they have really strong enforcement of foreign and commercial fishers. And so we've seen a huge decrease in the number of incursions into the reserve from these vessels. So just to give you an example, this picture is taken from a bust that they did in 2017. It was the largest shark finning bust in their history. It was a cargo vessel named the Fu Yuan Yu Lang 999. And this bus was a collaboration between the Ecuadorian Navy and the Galapagos National Park. When they boarded, they found over 6,000 sharks on board. Um, likely they were en route to be sold for, uh, for their shark fins. Um, this was horrible. These, these sharks were not caught within the reserve. Um, there, was, there was a study done later on where they found out that, that they were caught elsewhere. However, uh, carrying sharks on board your, your ship within the Galapagos is illegal. They are a protected species. And so they had tremendous global pressure to respond. And the Galapagos really responded in kind. Um, the captain and the crew of the ship went to jail for one year. The owner was fined $5.9 million and they confiscated the vessel. 
and of course the catch. And honestly, this response helped the world to see that environmental crimes are treated like any other criminal activity in the Galapagos. And it sent a very strong message about Galapagos enforcement. So as a result of stronger enforcement, there have been huge increases in marine biodiversity. In fact, commercial fisheries populations have all increased, which is a huge benefit for the local fishing communities. For example, sea cucumber, which were nearly decimated in the 90s, saw an increase of 233% between 2017 and 2018. And the Galapagos now has the densest shark population in the world. It has also become a top tourism site. So pre-COVID, of course, they were seeing about 200,000 visitors per year, which brought in about $200 million in revenue for the islands. Um, this is huge. It means that the community was directly benefiting from conservation. They were able to open up businesses, um, hotels, restaurants. People had another means of survival other than fishing. And so, I mean, you can just see the difference between coastal Ecuador and Galapagos. When coastal Ecuador was hit hard by a financial crisis 20 years ago, the Galapagos residents actually are doing pretty well because, because they've had this, this huge influx of tourism. So, you know, the Galapagos is a model of effective enforcement, but they also have strong community engagement and they listen to the needs of their citizens. As a result, they have one of the most diverse and flourishing marine ecosystems in the world. So there you have it. In order to change other people's behaviors towards a more, towards a more sustainable alternative, you must empathize, find common ground with your audience, engage, show them how they can personally benefit, and enforce, ensure that other people cannot benefit off of their sacrifices. So in closing, um, community engagement has never been more important than it is now. Um, COVID has completely changed the way that global economies work and it has impacted every, every sector of, of our work. Um, I mentioned that the Galapagos has been doing well because of tourism. Well, many of the MPAs that we work in depend on tourism for revenue. And because there's been decreased tourism, there's been less revenue for MPAs. Many rangers have, um, have not been paid in a while. They've had their salaries cut. Rangers have been laid off. Uh, businesses that depend on tourism have closed. Um, and so, you know, people are turning back to fishing. And illegal fishing has increased exponentially due to this limited enforcement and increased demand. But unfortunately, people have no other means to survive. And survival is a very, very powerful driver, as I found out last year. I mean, when you're struggling just to make it day by day, you're going to do whatever is easiest. And for coastal communities, that means fishing. Sometimes doing it illegally if they have to. If that's the only way that they can provide for their family, that's what they're going to do. However, if you give these people alternatives, and if we give them realistic actions that they can take towards sustainability, we can create change and we can eliminate illegal fishing, even in the time of COVID. But we can't change behaviors without the support of local communities. And to gain that, we need to earn their trust and ensure that their needs are met. So we as environmentalists have to listen and attempt to solve the problems that keep people from engaging in conservation if we hope to inspire people to change their behaviors. So before I open it up for questions, um, I'd like to go back to my original story and kind of end on a happy note. So this was Felix a year ago, and this is him today. Um, he just turned one year old in July. Um, and you know, it's been a really long journey, but he is healthy, he's happy, he's thriving. Um, he's crawling right now, which is, you know, it's a huge accomplishment for a kid that was born as early as he was. And, you know, my family has slowly started to heal from the ordeal that we faced last year. Uh, we're kind of trying to find a new normal. So it was a long time before I could begin to think about sustainability in my life again. Um, but my friends and coworkers at Wild Aid, um, who, by the way, are amazing environmentalists, all of them are, are totally committed to sustainability. Many of them are vegan. Many of them don't even have a car. <laughs> um, these guys, they never once made me feel like a horrible human being for prioritizing my self-care over sustainability. And honestly, that made a huge difference in helping me find my way back to my conservationist roots. So I just wanna say that if you really wanna encourage someone to practice sustainability or to change their behavior, 
approach them the way that you would a friend, like my coworkers did with me. You know, listen to them, give them a reason to change their behavior and ensure that other people cannot benefit from their sacrifice. Only then can we really change the world. Thank you very much. And now I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have today. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Sylvia. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't put the manta ray background on purpose there, but it seems like it goes perfectly with your, uh, your talk there. Um, Rachel, do you want to help me with the, the Q and A, or what are you thinking? Yeah, I. Uh, how about anyone who wants to ask a question? You can either put your question or just you know put your put your name and say I want to ask a question in the chat, and then. Um, I'll unmute you individually. I think with there's still about 66 of us here. I don't want to just blanket um, unmute. So uh, we've got Natasha and then Mary. So I'll go ahead and uh, unmute in the order we get the questions in the chat or the request for questions in the chat. Great, thank you. And give me just a give me just a moment to to find Natasha in the list. Hi. So my question was um, a lot of what you talk about uh, and kind of this talk of survival or trying to get people to see past um, kind of their immediate needs, it feels very applicable to just US society as a whole <laughs> um, or even in developed countries. And I'm just wondering, because this is something I struggle with on a daily basis is when you try and interact with people um, who don't necessarily have the same level of care about environmental issues, do you think the three E's can kind of work with Americans say? Yes, absolutely. I think, um, honestly, the, one of the reasons that I, I put the three E's together was because we are seeing a lot of this right now. Um, you know, some, a lot of people don't believe in climate change. They don't, they don't necessarily feel that many of the issues that we're dealing with are important. And I think that that's really, um, that's been one of the mistakes that we've made in the environmental sector is just focusing very much on, on external benefits and not so much on the benefits to the individuals, right? Um, so you can still, I mean, there are people that don't believe in climate change and yet they still practice sustainable actions because they're cool or because they fit their lifestyle. Um, you know, people drive Teslas, not necessarily because it's an electric vehicle, but because it's a nice looking car. It's a status symbol, what have you, right? So I think that, um, I think that, that that really is one of the ways that, that this methodology can work is forget about the environment when you're talking to people. You have these solutions in the back of your head, so figure out how they can potentially benefit somebody else. Installing LED lights in your house, yes, it's, it's great for the environment because they last longer, but the benefit to people is they might be a little bit more expensive in the short term, but in the long run, they'll save you money on your electrical bill. That's a concrete benefit that people can directly see. So I think that if we focus more on those types of solutions and, and how they directly benefit people, we can see, um, we can see more change. That's great. And uh, Mary Pattenberg, I will unmute you. You are up next. Cool. OK, uh, first off, huge fan of you as a person because I was super <laughs> about this whole presentation because it's exactly what I'm really passionate about. And my second question is, how did you get involved with Wild Aid after Miss, or did you do something else and then get into Wild Aid? <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, it's actually, it's kind of a funny story. Um, I actually got involved with Wild Aid while I was at Miss. I took a class with Professor Langholz and I think it was, um, we, had, we had our assignment on like finding your dream career or something. And I, um, I had to identify different companies that, you know, kind of did what I wanted to do and find people within those companies that had my dream job. And I ended up finding Wild Aid. In fact, actually, I think somebody recommended it to me. 
Um, but I found Wild Aid and my former boss, Marcel, is actually a Ms. alum and he was doing the exact job that I wanted to do. And so I reached out to him to get an informational interview and we talked and um, within our conversation, he had an opening for an internship. And so I ended up interning with Wild Aid for about a year and a half while I was at Ms. I did IPSS with them and um, it, was, it was great. I was able to live in the Galapagos for a few months. And once I graduated, they didn't actually have any openings for a full-time position, but um, I stayed in touch with, with Marcel and, and with some of my other colleagues there. And once they did have an opening, um, I, I jumped at the chance. Um, Marcel basically reached out and, and said, you know, hey, I have this opening, would you be interested? And I said, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, so yeah, here I am. Um, it's, I think in between, in between Ms. and, and um, Wild Aid, I ended up getting a, a different job working in fundraising and that, that actually really uh, was very helpful in my position now. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to chat with you more if you would like to learn more about like um, career tips and whatnot. Um, feel free to, to email me directly and we can- That would we can be chat. ideal. <laughs> I noticed you're on LinkedIn, not to be creepy, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please feel free to connect with me. I don't really go on there all that often. Um, cool. Honestly, the best way to get in touch is just email me directly. Um, it's on the slide. Awesome. But, um, yeah. yeah, reach Thank out. You. I'd be happy to answer questions. Mm -hmm. All right, Sarah, uh, so I'm going to unmute you. Feel free to ask your question. Hi. Yeah. So I was just I was reading recently about the the hunting that's happening outside of the the invis invisible line that exists in the Galapagos Islands. So I'm just wondering if if Wild Aid's trying to respond to that, if it's kind of outside of your your work, since there isn't really a jurisdiction that can you know or a community that can uh, help with that. So I'm just wondering how that's how it's going. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a really interesting issue. It's something that we've seen one form or another of over the years um there's it's a difficult issue uh we are we are working with it or working towards it to an extent um there's not too much that we can do as you mentioned it, there's it's not really there's nobody nobody really has jurisdiction there um however there are people that are looking into creating like a marine corridor or creating you know remote protected areas and um, you know, the nonprofit community is pretty small and the people that work in the Galapagos, it's a very, very small island community. So everybody kind of knows each other. And there are a lot of people that are, that are asking these questions and trying to figure out how we can best solve this issue. Um, so, so yes, we are involved. Right now, there's not really much that can be done. It is, it's a high seas issue, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it's Megan is up next. Uh, Megan, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was really awesome. Um, I was just curious, um, how long does Wild Aid stay in the community after you have trained um, local community members? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, we are committed to staying in in a particular project as long as it takes for them to um, to have a complete marine protection system. So I didn't really go into our, our model that much during this presentation, but we have um, sort of five elements that make up a complete marine protection system. And we have a six step process to, to help um, individual MPAs reach their potential and reach that full step. And basically the last step and, and where we would see ourselves kind of bowing out um, is when essentially a site reaches what we call regional leadership. And what that basically means is that they can manage their marine protection system independently. They, um, they are able to train new staffers. They have um, standard operating procedures. Um, they're, you know, they're meshed in the community. Um, we, and usually that process takes somewhere between five, 10 years. Sometimes it's longer. So for instance, in the Galapagos, which as I mentioned, is a very complex place they've basically already reached the regional leadership stage um, as far as we can tell however we've stayed there as technical advisors well one we have an office there um, but two they've generally asked for our help with very strategic initiatives and so we've helped them out with that so for instance um, 
a couple years ago, we started work to help them renew their fleet. And so over these last couple of years and uh, probably for the next couple of years as well, we're going to be helping them uh, try to, to modernize their patrol fleet and figure out what, you know, what next steps are in, in their surveillance equipment. Um, so yeah, so, so we basically, we do commit long-term to whatever project we, we enter. Great. And uh, Emily, you are up next. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks so much for this talk. It was really interesting. Um, I also worked on MPA advocacy at, at Pew, so it was really, really interesting to hear about uh, Wild Aid's perspective. I was wondering if you had any thoughts or, or if Wild Aid had any thoughts about the 30 by 30 initiative, um, which is a lot of um, organizations and nonprofits are, are pushing the language of like protecting 30% of the ocean by 2030, for those who don't know. Um, and, you know, I've heard a couple people uh, say that, you know, having that kind of set number is actually harmful because we might like create MPAs, like we might rush through processes and, and kind of create MPAs that don't end up being very useful or, 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 um, productive so but then on the other side like 30 by 30 does it's always good to have goals so yeah I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that <laughs> that's a good question um so I guess just short answer is we are supportive of 30 by 30 um we've we've been sort of involved uh with some of that um honestly our goal is to make MPAs actually effective and fulfill their conservation goals um a lot of the places that we work start out as sort of paper parks um you know they 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 have great um great goals great activities in theory but they don't necessarily have the mechanisms in place to actually protect their resources um, a lot of times the missing ingredient is that enforcement piece right and so um so that's kind of where we come in and we help them to fill in the gaps to essentially become an effective mpa um, I think the whole 30 by 30 thing and, and the argument about whether we might protect places that don't necessarily need protecting, yes, that is always an issue. We are very particular in the places that we work in. Um, I know that like Pew, Pristine Seas, um, Wait, there's a lot of organizations that are working um, in, in declaring new MPAs. And we actually do partner with organizations like that. In fact, we've partnered with Pew before. Um, we've partnered with National Net, Net Geo, National Geographic. We've partnered with um, Weight Institute. Um, so we are partners with several of these organizations and their guidelines for what makes an effective MPA and the places that we need to protect their guidelines for that mesh very well with our, with our standards as well. We always look for places that, um, you know, have something worth protecting. We look for places where, um, you know, there, there's a community that we can reach. We look for places that, um, you know, actually have feasible, achievable goals. Um, for instance, there are some MPAs in the high seas. We wouldn't necessarily have the expertise to, to work in these places. And so we're happy to, to figure out which of which of our technology partners or whoever might be best suited to that um, our our expertise is really in coastal near shore type mpas and so um so yeah and and yeah i mean i just i think that the organizations that are working on this they they have the same concerns and because of it the M, a lot of the mpas that are being declared and the ones that that are doing that are doing well are the ones that have the most support from these organizations mm -hmm. And uh, we had a comment from a gentleman. It looks like he's left the talk, but he said, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I'll use these three EU concepts in my thinking and ideas for influencing others toward conservation efforts. I am a conservation associate at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which means when they are open, they're closed now for COVID, we talk with guests about conservations. So just expressing his thanks. And I think that's the last question I see. So, um, I leave it to you, Jason. How would you like to? Um... Yeah, sure. Maybe Sylvia. You know, since we have uh, you know students on here, maybe you could talk a little bit about maybe preparation for careers. You know, in the kind of marine conservation field, any things you've seen out there, kind of that people should be aware of, good ways to position yourself, network. You know, especially in this COVID time when networking's a little 
more difficult, any, any career advice would be great. Sure. Um, so as I was kind of uh, mentioning earlier, I think informational interviews are one of the best ways to learn more um, about different, different prospects. Um, I think, I think one of the best ways to get involved in the field is to figure out what skills you have that can be of help. Um, and likewise, what skills you're missing that you could potentially bolster. Um, so let me, let me be more specific. So for instance, when I did my informational interview with, with Marcel and in working as, as an intern with him, one of the skills that I was lacking in was fundraising. And pretty much every nonprofit that you're going to work in needs, needs money. They, there will always be room for fundraising. So if you have any expertise in fundraising, um, that automatically will make you stand out. Um, and so for me, when I was, when I was thinking about future careers, um, and, you know, honestly, jobs in conservation are rare. It, this is a very hard field to break into. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but if you have the you know, if you have the right skills and you make, you make connections, um, I mean, it always helps to know people and, um, and keep in touch with them. If you can do that, um, eventually you can, you can get your dream job and you can figure out a, a way to, to be there. Um, for instance, at Wild Aid right now, we, um, we hired a, a part-time consultant um, who is a former MIS student as well. We hired her um, a couple years ago. And the, the way that I, I got to know her was just um, a fellowship. You know, we, we posted about a fellowship and, and she joined on and she was fantastic. And afterwards, when we were looking for a part-time person, she was the first person I thought of. We, of course, had a, had a job position open, but, um, and people applied, but really because I knew her work style, I knew what she had done, um, that was that was a huge help. So I would really recommend take advantage of internships, fellowships. Right now during COVID, yes, it's going to be really tough to get um, to get jobs, uh, that especially ones where you travel um, and things like that. But if you can kind of um, hang tight and and try to use your your skills in that way, you can eventually land a job. Um, it is a small community, and so even if you let's say you take a job at, at one organization, but really you wish to work at another one, just having a recommendation from somebody who's working within the same realm always goes a long way. Um, so, you know, do a good job. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I'd be happy to answer specific questions from people. Um, my email is right there. Um, oh, what else? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think that that's, that's my best advice for you is just talk to people, get to know them and stay in touch with them. Um, if you can go to events, especially things like this, like webinars um, are really helpful to, um, to learn more. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great, great. No, that, that's really, um, I think that's really helpful. It's funny, I, I wrote a little piece for the students and I said, you know, identify what your core strengths are and then identify what your secondary strengths are that you could build up, you mm -hmm. know, so you have kind of two things you could offer, right? It's kind of what, what you said, right? You had the, the marine conservation, but you needed to beef up with fundraising, right? And then you mm -hmm. came with like the full package for them. So mm -hmm. I think that, that that sits really well with that. Um, we'll probably be reaching out to you for some wild aid internships, I can imagine in the future. <laughs> and uh, we'll definitely try to get some more students your way. Uh, are there any final questions here for Sylvia before we uh, yeah. call it an evening? Yeah, there's one, one last question, Adriana. So let me find your name here in the list, Adriana, and I will unmute you. There you are. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so I just like to say thank you for your time. Your presentation was awesome. Um, so I just had a question about like, kind of like solutions for um, changing people's behavior. Um, I know that you said like, just kind of like understanding the community and kind of like, um, well, you talked about the threes, of course, but I was wondering like, what about like, um, what do you, what about like incentives? Like, what do you think about that? Like, would that kind of like change pe pe people's like behavior or perspective on like some things like, on conservation? Uh, yes, possibly. Um, 
Do you have any specific incentives that you have in mind? Um, well, I was just thinking about this question just because I worked with the, re the recycling system and also like trying to change people's behavior with that. Mm -hmm. And during this study, we were just focusing, we were just trying to like figure out some solutions of like how can we change people's behavior? How can we get people to recycle more? Mm -hmm. um, so we were just talking about incentives, like getting people like, um, if they recycle, then they get paid and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just like saying in general, um, cause I know that like for, not specifically for the, for the project, the Galapagos project, mm -hmm. but just like in general, like, do you think that could possibly be like a solution to change people's behavior? Yeah, um, so incentives are great. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of incentives. The, here's the, the only problem with incentives is that they're not always sustainable. So um, for instance, you know, when you pay people, that's great, but where is the money gonna come from? Um, if, if you're running a business, um, it might be a profit sharing type of thing, right? Um, if you're not running a business, if you're a nonprofit in, you know, working in a community and you're funding that payment to the community, eventually as a nonprofit, you might leave and then the community won't have that money coming in anymore and they might go back to their habits from before. Um, we've seen it happen a lot with, um, with places. I mean, even well-meaning organizations that let's say they donate a, a boat, right. To, to, um, and, and to Rangers and, um, and the boat is great. It works for a while. And then the, the nonprofit leaves. And then all of a sudden the MPA needs to pay for maintenance. They have to pay for repairs. And all of a sudden the, the MPA can't afford those repairs because the boat maybe is too much for what they have, right? And then they just let it fall into disrepair and then they're left with no patrol vessel once more. Um, the same thing with, with the community. If the community is being paid not to fish, that will work well in the short term, but eventually you need to find another solution, another long-term solution that is sustainable in order to keep them from, from continuing to fish. Now, if you just want to do a short-term thing, that's fine. And incentives do work really well there. Um, or potentially if it's like a longer term donation. So for instance, um, I mentioned something about um, having fishermen use sustainable fishing gear, right? And how the cost of that could be uh, prohibitive to a lot of people. Well, if you're a nonprofit and, and you know, you look at the community and you say, wow, like if these people had different fishing gear, they, they would actually use it that might be an area where you could donate the fishing gear. That would be an incentive. You donate it and then they have that gear and they can use it. And maybe they'll realize like, wow, this works so much better than what I was using before. And if it does break after the, the nonprofit leaves, maybe they'll purchase it again. Um, but it's, it's more of a longer term incentive than just, you know, payments on a, on a, on a day to day basis. Right. So that would be my only caveat and the, the thing to be aware of. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a great point. A lot of uh, things that start out, you know, well financed and then trickle off can almost, you know, it can go right back to where it was, right? Those sustainable financing mechanisms are the key. Yeah. You know, great, great point. You know, it made me think, I was thinking about the place I went to in Fiji where they had, you know, the dive operators, you know, were giving fees for every diver in the shark reserve, right? And it used to be that they would fish there and they would kill the sharks. And now I'm thinking there's no more tourism there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking what's happening to Benga Lagoon in Fiji when there's no, you know, is there somehow someone's coming in with some money or, you know, so that just made me think exactly of that issue. And, and like you said, all these places where the tourism money is going to it, COVID has really put a huge dent in that. And that was obviously hard to foresee, but a really, really tough, that's a tough problem to be in. Yeah, it's it's true. Honestly, I think it's causing a lot of nonprofits to reevaluate their stance right now um, post COVID because so many um, so many sustainable financing mechanisms for MPAs depend on tourism. It's like, oh, how are we going to create alternative livelihoods? How are we going to create new jobs? We will bolster tourism. We'll build a tourism center. We'll you know we'll invest in infrastructure, etc. And right now, all of that is dried up. So um, so yeah, so we have to think of of new ways to get these MPAs um, well-funded and encourage communities to continue adhering to these principles. Yeah, yeah, true, true. All right, well, um, I think that's some good food for thought for uh, 
for the next crop of uh, leaders here that you have helped to uh, get get well positioned for to launch their career. So thanks so much, Sylvia. It's been really good to see you. It's so cool to see your your son doing well. We all wish him the best and hope he's you know healthy and strong and uh, join the join the sustainability crew. So um, you know you have a great uh, great rest of the week, and uh, we'll 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 be sending some students your way for at least some informational interviews shortly. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, this is fun. Excellent. Take care, Sylvia. Bye-bye.